Hey everybody, so today we have a special guest. It is none other than Adina Brown, who is somebody that I follow quite extensively on LinkedIn. She always has amazing and uplifting and positive things to say. And today we are going to be talking about 15 observations and maybe some tips to bring more empathy and ethics into what we do in the data space, but just also as humans. So if that is something that you are interested in or passionate about, make sure you stick around. I definitely am on LinkedIn talking a lot about humanity and empathy and how we treat ourselves and of course how we treat others in the world. And so that has been something I have been interested in probably since I was a wee bit. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you the reason why is because, you know, I grew up with my dad being an immigrant. Um, he came here uh, shortly before <laughs> my parents had me and um, I would walk through life with him, even though I didn't have a deep accent. You know, obviously I'd look like him a little bit, but um, I would see people treating him differently because he had an accent and, you know, it was a little disturbing to me. Then as I got older, I of course experienced racism, um, that I really didn't understand. And so as I went through life, seeing women being treated differently, immigrants, et cetera, you name it, uh, people who are differently abled, you know, I started to really feel like I needed to fix things in any way that I could. So I got into politics. I've, you know, been in mental health outreach for, you know, over 12 years. So I've just always been trying to do things to make the world a better place. Um, so that that's it. I could go on and on, but that's that's where I, I come from. And so I'm on a lot of different, you know, people serving boards. And um, I also do DI uh, consulting, which is, you know, a, again, forwarding this mission mm -hmm. of getting people to understand each other and be kind and considerate to each other. So we'll get there one day, I think. <laughs> and I mean, what 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 a wonderful yeah human aspirations, right? Like that is one of the reasons I love reading some of the stuff that you post is it's just uplifting in general, right? Like to say like, Hey, you know what? Say a nice thing to a person today. <laughs> like you would think these are like common things, but I, I do think a lot of the time people just get so wrapped up in their own whatevers. And I think that we often miss the mark that there are people on the other side of that screen. Yeah. And I think people believe that empathy and understanding means that you have to be weeping and <laughs> falling on the floor for another person or completely and entirely understand their situation. We don't, you know, you say something to a person just to let them know that you understand uh, what they're going through. And that goes a long way as well, you know? So we have to remember, I would imagine in technology, of course, it's even harder to remember there are humans on the other side exactly. of the comments that we make, or even of course, when we're creating technology, there are humans that are impacted by it. So yeah. it just makes me think of the fact we're kind of forgetting the human aspect of everything these days. Um, like you're saying also in technology, because we're seeing a lot of things come out now that you yeah. know the AIs are being trained on human interactions, human art, human dialogue. And if we're not careful on both sides, right? So on the side of the computer scientists, you have to make sure that you're training it appropriately, ethically, making sure that, you know, your, your data sets are balanced as much as you can in, in whatever you're looking at, as well as, you know, attribution, making sure you know where your stuff is coming from and making sure that if it is derived, like the art, it's getting um, cited and uh, some of that copyright stuff is being uh, addressed. You know, in terms of like all the chats, especially for me, I feel like I, I totally appreciate all of it. I actually really, really do appreciate how quickly technology has advanced. Mm -hmm. I just you know, as we, I'm sure you know, this is a feeling I have because we've spoken before yeah. about it. Um, my concern, as is yours, is just who's behind it and how do we get more people of color? How do we get more people with differing perspectives to be a part of this creation process? And that is challenging because, you know, we're now in a time too where people don't even really want to work for someone else, let alone, you know, 
getting them to do something as complex as being in data science. And so, I mean, that is something that, you know, I love that you have this channel because you're opening people's eyes to this as a possibility, um, not only if they're in the space, like how they can be more ethical, but if they're not in this space, how can they become a part of it so they can change the world? So no one thinks of, you know, working as a data scientist or working in, you know, machine learning as changing the world in the way that it it really could happen yeah. because these things are going to move on without our approval, yeah. <laughs> whether we approve of it or not. Yeah. I, 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 I love that. And there are actually two ways that people can right now, if you're not a data scientist, if you just want to try to change the world in a, in a better way is uh, there's two things. So the first is to help create new data sets. Oh, so what that means is if you, um, for instance, I the, I live in New England. There are a lot of folks up here that are are Cape Verdean, which is a very tiny island uh, that is off the coast of Africa, and it's a mix of uh, African and Portuguese and probably a few other cultures all together. So there's a very interesting dialect that they have that is very unique. Guess what? The machines don't understand that because there's no data sets. There's not enough out there to help understand what that that dialect sounds like or what uh, how to identify it. Same with images, same with um, whatever uh, cultural traditions that, that someone has. All of these things, they need to have more data sets to train off of. And a, a regular person can can start to help with that. So if you just take, oh. yeah, mm -hmm. if you take an Excel spreadsheet and you just start to say, okay, here's mm -hmm. the, the word that I would use. And here's like the Merriam-Webster dictionary for it, like kind of a synonym mapping kind of thing. There is a website that you can put that up on and that is called Kaggle. And I'll put it up on the screen so people can see how it's spelled. You can just yeah, load great. up your, your, your data sets there. And that is one of the, that is probably one of the top places that data scientists go for data sets. The other one is GitHub. That one's a little more techie. So I'll kind of leave that one off the yeah. table. Um, but if anyone I've heard of that one, yeah, a lot of people know mm -hmm. about it, but if you don't know how to use it. So if anyone is interested in a video on how to load data sets to GitHub, please let me know because Kaggle just walks you through it um, very simply, uh, sort of like a, a wizard. Um, so I can I can put some some things in for that. But yeah, just creating like sets on yourself and the, the people around you and the way that you kind of see the world and the words that you use for it. That is a huge part of like, for instance, all of the, um, you know, open AI chat stuff that's going on in the news right now. It really doesn't know many other languages other than maybe English and Spanish. It knows a few others, but it gets worse and worse as oh. you get into languages that are not as prevalent on the internet. Why yeah. is that? Because it was yeah. trained on the internet. So the more we can put out there um, from a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different types of people is going to help with that. Okay. So you have more. There's other things we can do? Yeah. <laughs> there's there's one other thing that, oh. that is great. So I'm learning. I'm learning. it. <laughs> So the other one is called mm -hmm. Mechanical Turk. And so what that mm -hmm. is, is it's used by a lot of academics, a lot of industry people. And it's basically you can uh, become a survey taker or an annotator for different surveys that people put up. And so you can go and you get paid to do this. You get paid to answer surveys. And there are a lot of them on there that are looking for more of a diverse group of people because of the same issue that we're talking about here. The one to look for are annotation uh, yeah. projects. So what that means is you would be shown either text or images or something, and you as a human from your own perspective, tag it, tag it sort of like you know a Twitter tag on what you think yeah. it is, what you would call this, what you think that thing is representing. So it's a way to gather more of that information from a diverse group of people. So those are two ways. If you're not a data scientist, you just want to kind of put your own opinion out there and help make this a little bit better. That's one way to do it. Oh, I love that. I love that. That's so accessible. And it's actually really having an impact. So I love that. I think that when it comes to data science, it just seems so complex. And that even if you say data sets, I think the average person would be like, well, what is that? Like, yeah. how, 
I can't do that. But if if it really is just giving information, um, I wonder, you know, we have to take this worldwide. We all need to know <laughs> all the Cape Verdeans and my dad's from Ghana, West Africa. So there's definitely a difference in how we say things. I think it's it's interesting because even though I grew up with my dad, there were things that I did not understand he was saying till like I was in my thirties. Mm-hmm. Um, he, it was hilarious because my mom would often tease the words that he was using mm-hmm. when we were kids. He'd say, um, you know, you guys stop playing the buffinary. And I, I just thought that was a word for a very long time. Yeah. <laughs> so when he got older, I realized he was saying buffoonery. Um, but it was <laughs> whenever we were being so silly, my sister and I running around or like, you know, bothering each other. Yeah. Like, Stop playing the buffinary. And I just would always say that. I was like, the buffinary, don't play. And then I realized not until my 30s that he meant buffoonery. Or, you know, instead of saying pizza, he would always say pizza. He would pronounce it pizza. So, I mean, these are like, I, by the way, and this is what I love about humans. I love that we say things differently, mm-hmm. I love accents. I just love all things like that because, yeah. you know, even though it makes us all so different, I still always see the similarities we have, right? Because most yeah. humans, you know, love the people they love. They love their family. They love their kids, their spouses, et cetera. Or sometimes they don't love their spouse, but whatever, you know, <laughs> we all have like these fundamental uh, desires, which are, you know, to be healthy and happy. And so even with all those differences, um, you can still see that we're all, you know, very similar. If you go to another country, you see how people take care of their kids, yeah. you know, maybe the grooming process or, you know, getting their kids ready or, you know, whatever they're doing, shopping can be in different spaces or venues, but we all have the same fundamental um, desires. But I, I think that's what I think is so cool about humans and our languages and our accents is that they're all different, but then we're all the same. I, I think it's very beautiful. So. It, it is. And I, I talk about empathy a lot. Yeah. I wonder if we don't do more of that type of education, that type of conversation with people who are developing this. I, I wonder if that would actually help. I wonder if yeah. we could really sit people down who work in this space and explain to them how this impacts someone getting a job or how this impacts someone being able to communicate, you know, Um, I believe that it could be useful, but, you know, I'm curious, what do you think? Because uh, I, 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 I I can't tell you how much I, I, I agree with that. (laughs) It's it. So a part of it is called um, data and information literacy is like the word that we use to describe what you're talking about. And um, it, there is a book. I'll put it linked uh, down below, but this is it. This is a really good one yes, for okay. folks yeah. uh, that kind of talks about how do you really get more of your your um, individuals that are working on these things to understand it's not just a faceless person of some sort on the other side. Some of these things that we're doing can, can actually really hurt people, okay. not just, you know, um, hindering somebody getting a job, which is hurtful. Yeah. But physically, emotionally, there are so many um, studies and and things in the news, unfortunately, where we're not doing things um, according to what an IRB, uh, Institution, Institutional Review Board. That yeah. is what all scientists that are still in academia have to abide by. There is a board of people that looks at what you're doing and says, you know what? you, you were, you were doing something here that could hurt, harm people, mm-hmm. or you're doing things that people, if they're in your study would not really understand what you're, you're doing with them and with their information. Mm-hmm. It's, it's almost like we need more of that to happen at mm-hmm. these larger, uh, corporations that are doing this mm-hmm. as well as small startups, because I've noticed more of this happening in the small startups because they're just cranking things out, you know, yeah. as much as they can get the venture capital money. Yep. And they're yeah. leaving a trail of tears behind them sometimes. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's really, really, really unfortunate that that's, that's the driver. So I think that educating people on just first how AI works. So welcome to the channel. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's what we, we talk about a lot on the channel too, and not just understanding that, but I think getting more folks like yourself that 
are so passionate about this and really understand how to, you know, craft a narrative to help people kind of resonate and empathize with what's going on. There is a potential for people who work in those spaces to understand things from the more human aspect, Mm -hmm. if only we try. And I think these things get written off all the time. You know, I think people are feeling helpless. They're like, oh, everything is just going to go haywire. We can't do anything about it. But I believe we can. I think there has to be more conversations about the people on the other end of the technology that are being helped. So one of the things that I would say, like, if anybody's watching this, like, let's do it. Yeah. Educating at the college level. It's just not there. Like you maybe have one class about human and uh, what is it? Uh, Human machine interface or um, that's like HMI classes uh, or some kind of ethics, but it's one class compared to everything else. No, no, no. It needs to be a a, a court, a a piece of your course in every course. Like, okay, we're doing this. Where's your ethics check? Like yeah. it needs to be ingrained and not, not just like, okay, you're going to take your ethics class and then you're just going to walk away and do your own thing. No, every single assignment needs to have some of this in play. Do you okay. think it's because they have to get this done quickly? Do you think it is because they're constantly working on a project? They have to get it done in a short amount of time. Do you think that could be why? Is there no space for them to really dig deeper? The way that I would present this is I have... I have taught at university. Mm -hmm. This is from the dean of schools down. If Mm -hmm. your professor has a line on your grade that says, did you meet these ethical requirements? You're going to do it. So I think that's the problem. I think that a lot of not being the involved. curriculum is not addressing it. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. it's it to be enforced. I, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I was speaking to a professor in Princeton the other day about, um, actually it's about security. He teaches security, um, not only cybersecurity, but just um, also um, security in our, our nation, like national security, things mm-hmm. like that. And that is something that he comes across a lot. And if you can imagine also medical school, these are scary things. If you think about the fact that at one point, and, you know, I don't want to sound like an old fogey here, Ashley, but at one point people went to school and they were just immersed in it. They were immersed in whatever they were learning. They were immersed in it. They were focused on not only the outcome, the grade, et cetera, right. And passing, But it was, this is what I'm here to learn. I'm studying this and I want to understand it inside and out. That I don't know where, you know, we're going to get that again. (laughs) Um, But we we are in a microwave culture. And so people do want to get things fast. They want a good grade. They want to look good. They want a good title. They want, so everybody is really focused on the um, external um, view. You know, what do I look like when I have this degree? What is it going to look like if I have an A versus a D, whatever, Um, And so that is actually very scary to me. I think of all the things that we build in this world besides technology, but just all of it, buildings, um, people who are surgeons, if people are racing through the process of learning just so they can get to the end, oh, how terrifying. But, you know, that it is, it is scary, but I think, unfortunately, that is the way the world is turned. Um, And we... I think we have to pull it back some way, somehow, but especially like we're saying, these are very, very important roles that people are tasked with and it impacts people's lives for their entire life. You know, not just a piece of it. Like you said, it's not just about jobs that people aren't getting. It's about how they communicate um, things that they will be exposed to. You know, it, it is quite frustrating, but it's also something that I, you know, and I am not in this space entirely, of course, like I'm not in in technology entirely, but I have followed AI ethicists or people that have titled themselves that because I know it's becoming a field, but it's not quite fully formed as a field. Um, You know, I am wondering how do we speed that up as much as we're speeding up the output of creating the technology? How do we speed up this, um, way of monitoring Mm -hmm. how technology is being um, developed and how it's impacting humans. Yeah. Well, there's, there's some good news on, on the rise. So yeah. So GDPR is, is a part of it. There's, there's the, um, every state now has more 
of the, you know, data privacy stuff that's coming out. Yes, Uh, that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Helping people to understand and own their own data, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's important. Uh, That will help a lot is individuals being able to say, no, 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 this is not what my data says. And here's how I think my data is because you got my culture wrong or you got my language wrong or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there's also, um, there are regulations that are coming out in the EU on every company is going to have to um, have a certificate that says, you know, what level of AI is involved in name your service. So there are more things coming out in, in that vein. But then you get into things like TikTok Things yeah, I was you have to follow about, those. <laughs> I was thinking about TikTok. What can be done about that? I feel like if we do our due diligence in terms of having technology education in school. So I, I know that people are always working on something. That's going to happen too. There's going to be a company that goes into schools and talks about mm-hmm. this as well. But it, it's vital. And I think that the mental health component is not just about the images and seeing perfect bodies um, or people that don't represent us. I think it is also about the constant exposure to what's going on in the world. Yeah. It, it's overwhelming yeah. and for children to be inundated with it, especially adults to be inundated with it yeah. is not healthy. You know, right. um, there's a study that talks about how many products that we get exposed to in the day or how many choices we have is actually more, um, De- you know, it, it puts more of a strain on our brain than us doing like, uh, you know, multitasking on, you know, multiple projects at one time. Mm-hmm. Just the fact that if we walk into the grocery store, we have like 200 brands of pasta or um, so many choices of, you know, what road to go ta- go down. Yeah. These are all things that our minds and our bodies were not equipped it's to decision do. decision overload. I've yeah. heard, heard that a lot. Yeah. And so when it comes to the internet, I think it's kind of the same thing. It's the decision overload, but it's also the overload of information that we really don't um, need and are not able to process well. And I think it is causing more of a mental health issue than we all consider. You know, I think we are in an age where people feel like, oh, we, you know, we have so much access to knowledge and, you know, information that we should just bring it all in. But I know for me, it's too much. Like (laughs) it it really is. And I know for all of us, it is. It's just that we haven't understood that yet. It is, I believe, why many people are feeling run down. We're feeling overwhelmed by easy tasks. I, you know, surprisingly, you will see young people who just seem so drained at yeah. the end of the day. And you're like, well, what happened? But can you imagine they're being fed all these images constantly? You're in school, you're hearing about this, that, yeah. you know, we're not hearing about what's going on in a local community anymore. Right. You see that when you engage with someone at school, you're mm-hmm. talking about what happened to like Sue and Mary who live on your block and yeah. maybe a couple blocks over and that's it. Like Mm -hmm. now we know what's happening in any part of the world in a split second. And so I think all those pieces need to be considered too and technology and how we really as adults have to take the reins when it comes to kids and what they're being exposed to. Dina, from your perspective, you, you, you do a lot of education. You do a lot of outreach. What are some uh, tips that you would have for the technologists or the students that might be watching this? Well, the first tip I have, of course, is to be more curious because I feel like curiosity is getting lost. And Mm -hmm. that is a big part of not only just being um, educated in the best way, you know, being curious, but also being curious about whatever you're doing, the kind of impact it's going to have on your life, but the life of other people. Um, that you'll be reaching. So curiosity, I think is is key, number one. Um, the other thing that I think is so vital for people to have, whether they're, they're a student of data, data science and machine learning, is also for them to just pay attention to what is going on outside in the world. Um, so often we are only focused, you know, just in our, our own tiny little circle and we're not looking outside of us to see how, you know, people who are older are are impacted by just what's going on in the world or children, et cetera. So 
just having an awareness, um, walking through the world with our eyes more open, I should say, because we we are, as you said, you know, having our heads buried in our phones often. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we're, you know, by nature, humans tend to be a little selfish and self-centered. And so just, you know, being aware, just looking around us. The other point I, I feel in terms of students, but again, also people who are already in this career path and in this industry of data science and machine learning is check each other. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I I don't know how easily that happens in that world, because as I can imagine, it is um, fairly project oriented. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I I can imagine people are working on their own, and then they kind of bring ideas together at some point, but check each other. Yeah, I mean, community practice is a very common thing. Um, Having um, like meetups and things are very common in uh, data science. So create one on these topics. Yeah. Like you can get like-minded people to kind of come together and, and start to, to, to help in some way. Yeah. And I think of like cereal boxes that have had um, cartoons or something that depicted black people in a way that looked very inappropriate. And so I, when I say check each other, that is what I mean. Like if we see somebody putting out data or information or working on something or developing it, and it does not seem right, like let's check each other. And of course, that's where diversity comes in, right? Because if we don't have a diverse set of values, a diverse we'll set of on. impact, we won't pick up on any of it. And that also, to me, is why we need not just one person who's of a different mindset or mm-hmm. culture. We need multiple. Yeah. Because, you know, it can be scary to speak up. You know, for myself, I've been in that situation so many times where I was the only voice of color or the only woman. And I just happen to be a bold lady. <laughs> and I'll say things anyway. <laughs> but honestly, for most human beings, it's really hard to speak up if you are the only voice yeah. of that kind. And so, um, you know, I would, that's the third thing I would offer. I mean, I, I leave with that, but that's the thir- third thing I would offer is even if you're not of that group, speak mm-hmm. up if you see something happening that does not look right and, and may potentially impact people yeah. negatively. So I just want to offer those three things. Yeah, no. And I love that last one too, because in data science, crowdsourcing is, is a very common thing. So, you know, earlier in this, we, we were talking about like mechanical Turk, that's a kind of form of crowdsourcing. And what that means is even if in your organization, maybe you work at a very small place, like maybe there's five people working on this thing, mm. you know, making sure that you have some test groups and yeah. making sure that you get this in front of more people to react to. I hope that, uh, that uh-huh. there's a lot more Adina's out there that are going to be like, look, there's a thing there. Go look at it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. If anybody yeah. wants me to talk to them about the empathy part, I'm certainly for that. Yeah. <laughs> but yes. yeah, I think this is uh, just thank you so much for always having these conversations because it is important. And and like we're saying, there's not really much out there that is allowing people to take this as seriously as it needs to be taken. You know, this ethical part and, and understanding the need for inclusion and in all things technology, you know, so thank you so much for working. Jeez, oh, no, thank, thank you for being such a positive and uplifting voice out there and it's it's you you this is why I love having people like yourself on on the channel is it doesn't have to be a scary or behind closed doors kind of conversation which I think is what a lot of bigger organizations are kind of like oh what do I do I don't want wrong or whatever it's like no let's all go in with empathy and say we want to do the right thing we we want to make sure that we're not hurting people and that we are not just hurting, not hurting people, but making people feel loved and, and included. And like, they're not, you know, just on the side and maybe they have something that's going to help them. Like if they're visually impaired, like, oh, here's a thing that you can use to use our site. No, no, no. You should be first class in, in yeah. what we're trying to do here. And I think that that is shifting in the positive but we do need a lot more help and a lot more people and a lot more voices to continue that conversation. So thank you so much for coming on the channel. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Ashley. This has been great. All right. And with that, again, I want to thank Adina so much for joining me. This was a much longer conversation than I could put in the video. So maybe we'll have her on the channel again because she has a lot to say and she is absolutely fabulous. So 
With that, I want to thank you very much, and I'll catch you next time.